Okay, good afternoon. Uh, this talk is about uh, some uh, uh, memory cell that uh, was developed here over the last uh, several years that has some uh, optical properties and hence uh, coined uh, the name an optically sensitive, uh, optically sensitive uh, uh, memory cell. And uh, I will uh, uh, survey the development of this technology and finally lead to where it stands now and uh, hint a little bit about the development that is due to come within this uh, FTA project related to this topic. Okay, the starting point for us was work that had nothing to do neither with optics nor with, uh, nor with memory cells, but we've worked, uh, I don't know, for over 10 years on developing different types of high-K dielectrics. We started that long before it became popular and we developed a whole bunch of, of, of combination of materials that had very uh, nice properties, including those type of uh, high-K dielectric that ended up being standard in the microelectronics industry. And, uh, uh, and that when, when we really concentrated on making, the, the reason for the, the high-K dielectric is well known that you have to uh, shrink the thickness of the oxide in a MOS capacitor and eventually it breaks down. So you artificially increase the, the you, you, you increase the thickness and by having a high dielectric constant, you artificially reduce the, the effective thickness for the capacitance. And uh, we have routinely achieved uh, 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 materials and structures with sub nanometer, sub one nanometer effective oxide thickness. This is the standard way to measure that with very low leakage currents and even at high temperatures. But this was all very nice. In parallel, a, a process was developed here by several of myself and several of my colleagues uh, by which you make uh, metal nanoparticles in a very, very simple way. Um, we uh, deposit a very thin layer of, uh, of metal. First, we started out with gold. Eventually, we moved to platinum. And then by some special procedure uh, of annealing, uh, you get a duetting process and you generate uh, uh, particles which are fairly small, as a few nanometers, and they are fairly uh, uh, uniform in, in dimensions, and you can embed them in the electric structure. We will go back to this kind of picture later, but you can see a little bit here, uh, I hope this is clear, uh, some metal, gold metal nanoparticle uh, embedded within two dielectrics. So the combination of these two uh, tools led us to build, uh, in the beginning, uh, very simple uh, capacitors which are memory capacitors. Uh, the principle is very simple. You have this metal nanoparticle that form a deep potential well, and then by uh, applying a voltage, you can either uh, have a, a, a carriers from the substrate uh, tunnel through this thin so-called tunneling uh, uh, layer into and be trapped by these particles, and with the reverse voltage, you can extract them out, and, uh, and, you, and you make a memory. And here is some examples of, of some uh, nice uh, uh, microscopy structures. By the way, you can do that, of course, with one layer. You can do it with more than one layer. We've done double layers. You can do more. You can see here very clearly the nanoparticles embedded here. This is how we started out between two high-K uh, dielectric films, so hafnium oxide on both sides. Here's silicon, and here's a little bit of, of uh, SiO2, which is uh, uh, kind of a parasitic uh, film that is, that is formed as the high K is growing because of the temperature. And here you see the same thing with the double layer. So you have two layers of the nanoparticles. You can see them very clear here in an STM picture. And that turns out to have very uh, beautiful memory, uh, uh, memory uh, pro, uh, uh, characteristics, so the single layer and double layer. Here shown is the, the, the level of voltage swing that you have to apply in order to get this hysteresis. And you can see that uh, for example, for the plus minus four volts, you get almost a five volt hysteresis window, which is quite large, and so on and so forth. The important thing, of course, is that you can do that by applying only plus minus one volt. You get about one or 1.2 volt hysteresis uh, width and a little bit more in the double layer. And that is very, very nice and quite useful. And of course, being a memory, you, have to, uh, you also have to see whether this holds. So we've done standard uh, uh, retention tests by, by kind of accelerated retention tests. There's standard procedures to that and extrapolated to about 10 years 
you see that uh, the, the memory holds up very, very well. This is a standard test. If you, you can even go to high temperature, of course, uh, that works a little bit less good, but still retains the, the capacity quite well. Um, okay, the next step, of course, is, 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 virtually is, to, is to make a transistor. This was a big, a big issue in our microelectronics center because for many years, no transistors on silicon uh, have been made, but the process was developed. And uh, this, so this is, this is, this is a, a, a CMOS transistor, except in the gate, you get the same as, as a stack of uh, SiO2 nanoparticles, in this case platinum, and then the high K dielectric. And, and here you see a little bit nicer, so you see here very clearly the nanoparticles, the hafnium oxide. This is again the metal uh, nanoparticles in a, in a, in a high-resolution SEM picture and the distribution. And if you just use it as a transistor, it is more or less a standard uh, transistor in terms of its characteristics. But you can then, of course, make use of the, of, of the nanoparticles. So if you look in the gate, uh, you have capacitor, so it's very similar to before. You get the hysteresis quite efficiently in the, uh, in the, in the capacitance. Or alternatively, you can do, look in the transfer function, so the, the drain current is a function of the gate voltage, and again, you get the hysteresis in the, in the threshold uh, voltage, and it works very, very well. And here you can see the, 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 the mapping out of how wide the, the, the memory window is for a given applied voltage. And again, it is quite, quite efficient, so you get a lot of hysteresis for, for little voltage. Okay, one step farther then, we moved uh, 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 to look at the optical properties of that. And, 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 and so it's a very similar structure, except now this is a capacitor again, except like in the, uh, in the MOS transistor, the tunneling layer is SiO2, not the uh, high K. Then you have platinum and then hafnium oxide and then you get contact. And, and, and then you see the following. If the substrate, the silicon substrate is low doped, okay, then it becomes very optically sensitive. In other words, you can generate a lot of photocurrent in a low doped silicon. And then as a function of the intensity of the, of the light, uh, you can see here for the same, uh, this is here with 350 nanometer illumination, just from an LED. As a function of the intensity of the light for a given voltage swing, you see that you can control the, the hysteresis window. In other words, you can, you can turn things around and keep the voltage constant and you can basically write the memory uh, state by, by illumination rather than by, by a voltage change. And uh, just to make sure we understand where this is coming from, we, we repeated the experiment with a highly doped uh, substrate. And here you see both the IV and the CV curve and the IV curves with and without illumination, and you get nothing. And that is because that if you have a lot of, uh, a lot of carriers here, then uh, the additional photocarriers that you can generate make very little difference. But if you start out with a very low doped here substrate, then they make a big difference and, 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 and you get this optical effect. And then you can look at the spectral response here and you see that it more or less uh, looks like the, in this case, more or less looks like the absorption function of a standard silicon detector, which is just a commercial device. Okay, uh, later on, and that is now the, the, the highlight of, of what I want to tell you and where our work will go in the future, we did something quite similar, except now we move to a soy uh, substrate. And there are several configurations one can envision. You build the capacitor here. Eventually, also, we will be the transistor. You can add the back illuminate, which we haven't done yet because it requires an additional process in the back side here. But we will do that. Uh, or you can uh, illuminate from the front, in, in, from the top. In reality, this is kind of a, an artist view of, of what we have here. And, and we basically the light basically goes here in, in, in between the two electrodes. Okay, and here again is the, is, is the cross-section, uh, uh, um, electron micrograph, the transmission electron micrograph. And, and really quite, quite an important difference between the soy uh, uh, structure and the, and the bulk substrate is in the fact that because when we, we form the nanoparticles, we use a, a, a thermal annealing, rapid thermal annealing, and the heat, because of the, insula the insulator of the, the thick uh, SiO2 here, the heat doesn't have any place to go, and there is some additional thermal processes taking place at the surface, and the nanoparticles get kind of pushed into the SiO2 in that case, and that basically means that the tunneling layer becomes thinner, and then it becomes a little more efficient, a little faster, and so on and so forth. 
So that was also just uh, uh, fairly well understood. Here is very briefly a, a, a schematic, a very you know, kind of uh, caricature schematic of how things work. So again, you have here the, the potential barrier because of the metal nanoparticles, and by voltage you feed them through the tunneling layer in or out of, 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 of this, uh, of, of this uh, layer, and you simply generate a lot of uh, carriers by illumination, and therefore you apply more of them, and hence the optical uh, triggering uh, can act as the equivalent of the voltage swing. Okay, so, so on this uh, soy, soy sensitive uh, uh, capacitor, so here is without, without uh, any illumination, you get just a, a capacitor with, with the metal nanoparticles, and you get this hysteresis, and if you illuminate, again here at 350 nanometers, you get a much wider, uh, 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 wider memory window for the same voltage swing, and again, this is the optical function that, that you have here. Very interestingly, you can also look at the photocurrent. One would think that since this is the electric uh, film, then, then there will be no, no, no photocurrent, but in reality, you can break down the photocurrent by, by applying the proper voltage, and then you, have a, yeah, then you have a photo detector, and it turns out that you can have uh, the hysteresis also in the photocurrent. So if you have a structure with no nanoparticles, so same soy structure without nanoparticles, you just make a photo detector, so you get here the current as a function of uh, illumination intensity, and you see simply a photo detector. But if you look uh, with the nanoparticles, you can get the hysteresis here in the, in the, in, in the photocurrent, and, and that is also something that is very useful and has many potential applications. Look a little more details in that, so here again you see the, the, in, the, in the reverse bias, you get the illumination uh, in the dark and in illuminated, and you get the two hysteresis line here, and you get here also some hysteresis in the forward bias, that was a little bit hard to understand, but that can eventually be explained with a shot key, with a shot key diode model, and, and, and back here again, back to the reverse bias as a function of the voltage swing at the constant intensity, you can see that you can control the, this hysteresis in the, in the photocurrent. And finally, this is probably the most important uh, view graph, or at least most important for our future work. This is a little bit, uh, little bit uh, complicated figure. You, you get two, two spectral, through, through, through detection spectra here. One, the blue one, is simply photocurrent. And that is, uh, you can see here the, the photocurrent of the, uh, uh, the spectrum of the photocurrent, everything is normalized. And if you compare that to UV detectors made on soy in the literature, it's basically the same thing. Very, very similar, very similar widths and very similar uh, changes between the peak uh, wavelength here around 400 nanometers to what you get at long wavelengths. The red line here is a spectrum, okay, of also of the detection sensitivity, but the measure for sensitivity here is the change in the width of the hysteresis for a given voltage swing. So this is another way to, to, to have the, uh, a measure of the sensitivity to wavelength. And what you see here is a very, very large enhancement, mainly at the short wavelengths of here. You normalize it artificially here in the, in when you plot it at the peak. You get the peak at roughly the same wavelength, and a very, very large extension of the sensitivity at short wavelengths. And basically, we don't know what goes on at shorter wavelengths because the setup that uh, is available at Technion to make these measurements basically stops at 220 nanometers. Okay, now, thinking about that, we kind of conclude that, that what happens here is that the, 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 the metal nanoparticles in these type of structures basically serve two points, two, two, two roles. They act, of course, to, to be a, the, the, for the current storage, as they are uh, in all these memories that we made, but they also form some enhancement of the uh, detectability of this thing, and, and, and therefore you get here this enhancement, mainly at the short wavelengths. So, um, the, the, these things as they stand right now, they are quite efficient in, 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 in the optical response uh, in the UV and also uh, in the, on the long wavelength side of, of where the silicon, uh, silicon reacts. Uh, and it's a detector with a latching functionality, so you make a, a memory, okay? And the metal, part, uh, metal dots, we believe, uh, they, they basically play two roles. Of course, they store, they store the charges, but also enhance the detectability. And, and from that point on, we take that further, and we started to work uh, on, on, on actually uh, doing that in a little bit more controllable way. So first of all, we will separate the 
storage functionality from the detection enhance, enhancement and, and we will make these uh, well-defined uh, uh, metal enhancement with some uh, nano antennas on, on, on the surface on top of this, uh, of this uh, 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 contact here. And, and, and even more important than that, we have started a process of uh, developing some technique to make pre-positioned uh, metal nanodots which will en enable us to make the same type of devices but on a much smaller scale, uh, gaining uh, basically in two ways as usual, A, in, in, in area that this thing takes, and B, in the potential speed in which it works. Okay, this work uh, was done uh, by many people. Uh, much of it was developed within a consortium uh, that, that was on here in, in this country uh, called Alpha, which had to do with low power uh, electronics. The vast majority of the research was done by Dr. Besso Michaelsvili, sitting here someplace in the audience. <coughs> Basically, from the beginning of the work on high dielectric, it's all his ideas and his, his making. But we have a lot of collaborations, mainly within this Alpha Consortium, uh, with the group of Professor Yossi Zaltzman from the EE department, uh, mainly on the fabrication part. Uh, with the group of uh, Wayne Kaplan from Material Engineering, mainly on the analytical analysis part. A lot of help from the uh, uh, clean room team in, in, in our department, and there's two people here, but there are others also. And we had a close collaboration with a, a local a semiconductor fab called the Tower Jazz, which were kind of leading partners in this Alpha Consortium. Thank you very much. Some doubts that the gold can give plasmonic. Uh, the gold give you some plasmonic enhancement in ultraviolet. It's not gold. It's platinum. Yes. Uh, it's platinum. It's, platinum is, is it's not, not optimal. Good. Yeah. It plasmonic enhancement. Yeah. Uh, my question is, if you're using gold or platinum, are they allowed in the silicon CMOS technology? I don't think so. I mean, that Normally, they uh, only use copper. Why not use copper? Uh, we may. Metal. I don't know. That, okay. Uh, I'll answer in several, uh, several ways. We started out working with gold because that, that was easy and that's what we did. When we began to talk to the people from, from, <coughs> from the real uh, fab, uh, they more or less told me, if you bring gold, don't even go into the, into, into, into the cafeteria. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and somehow they made us understand that platinum would be okay. It turned out to be not true. They, want, they don't want to know from platinum also, at least not in a major way. But it was nice for our work, and, uh, and, and, and it brought us where it brought us, and, and you saw the result. We are now basically rethinking most of this work within this new, uh, new uh, uh, um, FTA, mainly the optical uh, detection enhancement part. And there we will use whichever is the best materials. It could be, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that is one of the things. That, that's on the agenda. But it, it was never designed to be an optical enhancement thing. Uh, it just somehow, once it happened, thinking back in hindsight, that, that was the conclusion. Okay, we have to go. Thank you, Gadi.